So good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for having me here. I'm very excited to participate here. I don't, I don't get to do this as much as I would like. Um, and it's interesting, a little history, growing up a really shy kid, public speaking somehow developed uh, into a competency of mine. I love doing it, but I don't get to do it as, as much as I would like. So thank you for having me here. And, uh, and uh, hopefully this is of value to you. And you know, before I kick in, um, as Brett explained, I'm gonna just kind of give you a flavor for um, the world of visibility, why it's important, um, what's driving it from a supply chain disruption perspective, and then kind of what the underpinnings are when we talk about visibility. What it mean, what does it mean? Because it's a bit of a it's a bit of a nebulous term in the in the industry now. But I wanted to set the table on you know just the on the speakers and and not to pre-introduce my my peer in the industry. But um, it's an interesting circumstance here because Bart and I, who Bart's going to be speaking next from P44, while we compete in the space, he and I worked together for 15, 20 years in the space. Like, just a long time, long time. So we both come from, a, we have a shared experience of this whole supply chain technology space. So what I would, inv I would in invite you to do, while I certainly have a lot to say, and we'll say a lot of things, feel free to interrupt and ask a question, take me off track. I'm more than happy to, I'd be ecstatic if you did that rather than me uh, sit here and, and or stand here and drive a monologue. So, and do the same for, for Bart. We just, we've both been around the block uh, as it were and, and seen a lot of different things and give a lot of different perspectives. So uh, please take advantage. So what we're gonna talk about is this notion of, especially this emerging, space of visibility and specifically where we um, operate today is, is this notion of what we call real-time visibility and so the first question that you might ask is well why why is this space important and you know we often talk about a lot of trite things right disruptions disruptions happen in the supply chain disruptions aren't new the interesting thing though is if you look at the last four or five years right maybe a little longer, it feels like disruption now has a new face. It's not just one thing, it's a constant stream of things. And certainly we all live through COVID and the changes that that has driven and the, the, certainly the tur turmoil that that's driven on uh, or applied to the supply chain. But think about the other types of disruptions that have happened over the past, call it half decade or, or a little longer. Because disruption isn't just things like COVID or geopolitical challenges that we're seeing in Europe or a tsunami hitting somewhere in, in the Far East. Te disruption also includes things like technology, uh, technological disruption, right? Business disruption. Think of what you know, we've been talking about for years around the Amazon effect, right? And how companies have had to pivot to change how they operate in, in a new normal. Think about changing consumer sentiment. Right, how we all operate. There's a lot of young people in, in the room, right? All mobile enabled, buying things on your phone, on your tablets, right? And I, I'll, I'll confess, you know, prior to COVID, I was still one of those, those folks that I would research something on my computer, um, but I'd go buy it. You know, I'd whip over around the corner to Best Buy or wherever else I had to be and, and buy it in person. Uh, COVID brought out my inner hermit, and now I don't leave my house. So, so disruption is now, it feels like it's constant. And so the requirement now for organizations where supply chains generally have always operator, operated around this notion of hyper-efficiency, right? That's what supply chain uh, is always about, is being hyper-efficient. Now there's a new buzzword or a new word of the day, which is resiliency, right? And if, if those of you that aren't English majors and you need to Google what specifically resiliency means, it's the ability to adapt, right? To rebound. If there's a disruption, how do I pivot quickly? How can I be uh, elastic and be able to adapt quickly to those disruptions, whether those are macro disruptions or point disruptions? And that's where this exciting space of visibility comes into play because it allows organizations, you know, you hear a lot about digitization, digital transformations, it becomes the underpinning for making those things happen. Now, I spoke a few weeks ago, we had a conference and one of the analogies I used was um, 
was something I do in my personal life. I'm a long distance athlete. That's my hobby. I do things like Ironman, marathons, that kind of stuff. And I use the analogy just to make it real for people on the technological change that we see where, you know, when I started, when I was some of your ages out there and I started running, right? I didn't even have a sport watch, let alone what I use now. I literally, you know, would drive my route in my car, my mom's car, and to figure out the distance. And then I checked the clock before I left and checked the clock when I got back. And that was my notion of training. And those were, that was my notion of visibility, right? Today, I have so many sensors that could tell you so much information. I literally have a sensor that will tell me if I'm pedaling on my bike, how much power I'm exerting in the circular motion, how level my foot is, and whether it's centered. I mean, that level of granularity, right? And the value is, is these types of things now I can, I can aggregate, I can turn into analytics, and I can do things at, a, at an entirely different level than I could before, right? It also gives me things to spend, mon spend money on, which is kind of cool, as I love my gadgets, right? But that's the, that's the power of data and visibility and what you can do with capturing that type of information. It allows you to do things from a, you know, a, 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 an operational perspective that we just couldn't think of before. And one of the challenges that we find with a lot of organizations, and I know Bart will talk about this as well, one of the challenges when we start talking about this topic for a lot of our customers is that sometimes they don't even know what questions to ask because the art of the possible now is possible. So when you think about you know, what this means, right? it's really allowing a level of transformation for organizations to happen faster and to happen in different ways that quite honestly, they couldn't do even, even a handful of years ago. So when we think about a journey, a digital journey and where, you know, where companies can, can evolve to, right? Most organizations out there, and this, doesn't, this isn't predicated by whether a company is big or small. In my experience, you know, through my almost 30 years in the supply chain technology space, I have seen massive organizations do very rudimentary things, right? So you'd be amazed at sometimes the lack of maturity out there, even for organizations or brands that you're incredibly familiar with. But everyone starts with this whole notion of just being able to see things, right? And it all, and that's the underpinning that starts with data, just being able to get at the level of visibility on the basics that, that are happening in your network. The real exciting thing about this space, and just to, to give you a, a level of degree here, you know, coming out of the transport space, which is where I spent a lot of my career, you know, if you got a signal, an EDI signal, right, 10 years ago, if you got an EDI signal once a day, you were lucky. If it was right, you were super lucky. Today, in a world of GPS enablement, I mean, I'm literally getting real-time pings. Right, that's the difference in the availability today that we didn't we we didn't have before. So getting that pool of data, it starts with capturing that data. That's why this space is such an exciting one, right? And both Bart and I, when we made our career decisions to kind of look into a new space and look at new endeavors, we both ended up. It's no coincidence we ended up in the similar industry, right? because the opportunity is incredible and the technology is changing so, and so rapidly. But once you have that underpinning of data, now the things you can do with it become really interesting. So many of you here are studying artificial intelligence, machine learning, right? The applications of those things, right? What do you need to drive those types of algorithms? This is the audience participation part of the presentation. You need data, right? You need lots of data. You need disparate data. You need data that seemingly is not connected, right? And so this is the opportunity that's provided is bring, bringing those un underpinnings together. So when you start to do that, you can start to, you know, make, you know, go from reactive to now things like we use the term predictive, right? Or prescriptive capabilities. And then the next evolution now is you can start to look at things collaboratively. Right, so one of the things we often talk about in this space, right, especially coming out of this world of real-time visibility, you know, starting this no world of transport, right. So if I'm a, a typical, 
you know, retailer is an example, and I want to tap into my fleet, or I want to tap into my common carriers, and I want to get real-time real visibility to understand what's going on in, in my network. Well, think about how much of a network any one company controls. So that value of that data is great, but reality is, you know, for a retailer, for example, or even a consumer goods company, they're only controlling a portion of their freight. So you're really only getting visibility to a portion of your network. So the next evolution becomes this world of collaboration. How do you get the real network to participate, right? And pro provide underpinnings so that you can start to make more end-to-end -end supply chain decisions rather just on things that you can control because that's a bigger picture, okay? Then you start to get into this whole world of, um, of where we want to be able to go, which is automation. Right In my old uh, company at Blue Yonder, we used to talk about the autonomous supply chain as the moonshot. We're not all there yet. This is the, this is the nirvana where we want to get to as an industry. Right? How do you start to bring these together, these capabilities together, this, all this data that we, that, that we prescribed and drive interactive use cases across an entire organization? That's the nirvana. That's the challenge. And the other example I use, going back to my, you know, my, my athletic pursuits outside of work, so I have this, these cool sensors, I can get all this data. But the other cool thing from a technology perspective that has really driven advancements, and you know, what's exciting for me is we have all these advancements that we take for granted in the consumer world, but they haven't all translated into the enterprise world. And one of the things that we take for granted is the notion of the app ecosystem. So think of how you interact with your mobile devices. And I use the term mobile, it doesn't really matter if it's mobile or your television or your tablet, whatever it happens to be. But think of the notion of the app ecosystem, right? What are the things that happen there that we take for granted in addition to having access to an incredible amount of data and the application of machine learning? Well, you know, you have common sign-ons, you have integration across applications. It's ubiquitous integration. Right, so when I think about my world and I'm training and I'm competing, I've got five or six apps that I use to drive different use cases. They're all connected to one another. I didn't have to do anything except for have a common sign-in, which is, by the way, I will confess, I still have a Hotmail account. It works. I know, right? So this is the exciting part. When we talk about this nirvana and this notion of an, auto, uh, of an autonomous supply chain, that's where we need to be able to get to, where things like integration are ubiquitous. Right? And the idea is it's not about feature and function. It's about use cases now. It doesn't matter whether I have one application that solves everything. I want to be able to get at the collection of capabilities that are out there and drive personal use cases. So that's, you know, for me, from a technology perspective, and that's usually the lens I like to, to talk about things, that's the excite, exciting part of where this industry is going. And again, you know, this space that we operate in, this real-time visibility space, it's only about six or seven years old, right? So the amount of, of acceleration of advancement in technolo technological capability, it's just, it's rapidly increasing. So, you know, this notion of an autonomous supply chain, I say it's, you know, it's a nirvana, quite literally with the way technology is evolving and what we, you know, the fact that we can do a lot of these things in our, our consumer worlds, it may not be that far. So interesting perspective. So now let me just skip ahead because how's my time? He's my, he's my time caught. I'm good, I'm good. Okay, oh no, that's good. Let me, click, let me click ahead, right? So when we talk about real-time visibility, um, you know, I want to share with you. So what do we mean? Like what are those underpinnings and where that, does that need to go? So first and foremost, one of the, the problem that we're tackling in this space Typically, when you hear the word visibility, and this is an important point, because visibility, again, is a nebulous term that's used in the world of supply chain. Every application that, that's out there, whether it's a transportation management system, a WMS, you have a plethora of control towers out there, ERP, all these terminologies that you, that you, that you hear, they all provide a level of visibility. Specifically in this space, what we're talking about, at least to begin, is the notion of real-time transport visibility. Where's, you know, it started at the vernacular we tend to use is where's my truck, right? Where are my goods? So just like I can track my phone today or my, you know, my watch can track where I am when I'm running or, or biking, I can now track an asset in a network. 
This is important information because now I can do things again, I can become very predictive on you know, when is something going to arrive? And if I can know, if I can get predictive on when it's going to arrive, and especially if there's a disruption, I can now get ahead, whether it's ahead of consumer sentiment or consumer interaction, or even ahead of, uh, you know, if I'm, you know, I've got an expectation that a, a container is going to arrive at a port on a certain day, but now I have predictively know that it's going to be three days late. Well, now I can make supply chain decisions to be able to accommodate that within my, my broader network. So the importance of having that visibility of that core data is a key underpinning to making major supply chain decisions and driving that, that resiliency. So starting with the core modal capabilities, and by the way, Bart and I were talking about this when we were sitting at lunch, this is non-trivial. It's not like buying a watch and just being able to go running. There's a lot of issues around onboarding and getting cooperation and getting providers to share that information. That's a lot of work. And you know, in this, in here in the U.S., I'm Canadian, by the way, so I, I'll say the U.S. specifically, right? You have the ELD mandates, right? All the trucks have have technology. That is not the case everywhere in the world, right? There's a lot of variability around the, the technological availability, which makes a lot of this difficult. But then you start to to flesh that 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 pane of glass out with other things. So when we talk about again AI and ML. Right? What's the, you know, what drives the usage of a lot of those use cases? Well, you have to not just have big data, but you have to have disparate data. You have to have multiple feeds of data. So knowing where the assets are and where they're moving is great, but what about all the other things that could be impacting those things? Weather, operations, what's happening at a terminal, right? All of these things have to start to build, come together to build that picture, right? So getting that data at all the different nodes becomes really important. And then layering that with additional signals and any data that you can bring to bear becomes valuable, right? Anything, you know, and this is where it's really becomes interesting from, you know, everyone heard the term SNU when you talk about SNU data, right? All, you know, news and social sentiment, all these things, starting to bring those type things in, in, into bear um, allows now a real petri dish for applying AI and ML and interesting things. And that's where you come into the world of predictability and, and prescriptive, uh, prescriptive capabilities. And then where you want to evolve into then is it's great to have that underpinning from a transport perspective and, and you know, to be able to tap into, let's say the circulatory system of a supply chain, but eventually you want to start to adapt, apply that to other, other functional areas. And one of the slides I kind of skipped over, one of the reasons why this is hard for organizations is organizations, forget the technology perspective, but many of them are very siloed in the way they operate, right? That's always a challenge, right? Is how do you get organizations to break down the walls internally and to start sharing data, sharing visibility, being able to do things and, and, and cross boundaries to solve problems. This is where I used the term earlier in, the, in, in this short talk, but I used the term use case, right? And this is an important term for everyone, when you, especially in the technology space, because that's becoming the, 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 the kind of standard of how uh, organizations want to be able to solve problems. It used to be about functional silos. That's the world of ERP, right? I buy a module for HR and I get a module for finance and I get something for transport and warehouse, but they weren't all interconnected. Now they're thinking about use cases. What's the end customer result that I wanna be able to solve for? Right now, I don't care about my, my functional um, walls that I, or uh, functional walls that I build up. I just wanna solve the problem for the customer. So creating this underpinning and creating the connectivity of that and layering it with other real-time data within, within the supply chain becomes critically important. And that's where organization, this space is evolving to Right, and we're getting into this world of, you know, how can organizations really tap into this this repository of capability to drive a true digitization agenda? One minute, sir. Hi. What's that? One minute. One minute. I am there. So I included, and I and I shared this content, but I included a couple of case studies, but I, I didn't want to really want to get to those because that sounds too pitchy. Um, but there's a lot of organizations, big organizations now that are adapting this on both sides of the equation, whether it's on the transport side, 
or on the shipper side. And you'll see if you kind of scroll through these, one of the things that's common is exactly what I was laying out. It's one thing to be able to get at the data, but then to be able to take that, right? And I know Bart's going to talk about this as well and translate that into use cases and, 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 and executable value. That's the real trick. And for a lot of these organizations, part of our challenge, right, is as technology providers is to help educate them and help them understand the art of the possible on how they might be able to apply these things. Because it's like, it's like bringing fire to a caveman because they, you know, they, they haven't had the ability to see these things before, so they're not sure what to do with it. So it's really, I mean, again, you, hopefully you hear the enthusiasm in my voice. It's, it's a real exciting space to be in. And it's, it's really cool to be part of a space that's really driving an incredible amount of innovation. So with that, any questions? Do we have time for questions? Okay, then I'm gonna stop talking. Thank you very much. <laughs>